is indeed a blessed Sabbath day. Let me begin from where the choir left. That you are my brother, you're my sister. So take me by the hand. Together we'll do what? Until he comes. Together we'll work until he comes. It is forming the basis of my sharing today. Because what I want to share with us is a special work that God left us to do, that Jesus commissioned us to do while we still live in this planet called Earth. And through it all, the only thing you need to hold on to, or the only thing that you need to hold firmly in your heart, in your mind, and in all your ways, is the trust in Jesus. I have entitled my sermon, I have entitled my study, I leave you with this faith. It is, it is a statement that when somebody tells you, it is a statement that when somebody tells you, if somebody comes and tells you, I leave you with this faith, it means that that person is probably on their way out and so they're giving you something that will help you to move on in life, right? When Jesus was leaving his disciples, he prayed and told them something very interesting in the book of Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Someone can read it, or you, and you can actually project it on the screen so that we can leave, read it together. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Jesus gives a statement to his disciples that I want us all to reiterate or to re-echo. Okay? Uh -huh. This is what Jesus says in verse 8 of Acts chapter 1. Let's read it together from the screen. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Uh -huh. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, uh -huh. all Judea, and Samaria, uh -huh. and and to the ends of the earth. Let me take us back to the book of uh, Genesis chapter, we are going to read the book of Genesis chapter 37 all the way to chapter 49. The book of Ch Genesis chapter 37, we are going to read it through up to chapter 49. I know it may be so voluminous for us to read it today, but I will be paraphrasing as we go step by step. If you read the book of Genesis, a story is presented to us. A story that is presented to us is the story of a young man, Joseph. We all know the young man, Joseph, right? We all know the young man, Joseph, right? The young man, Joseph, was one of the sons of Jacob. Actually, the beloved son, the, be the most beloved son of Jacob. Jacob had 13 children. Let me bring us back to that origin. Jacob had 13 children. The firstborn was Reuben. And the lastborn was Benjamin. Right? Right? Yes. The firstborn was Reuben. And the lastborn was who? The lastborn was who? But where does Joseph come into play? Joseph comes in this question. Joseph comes in this family as the firstborn of the favorite wife. I want you to understand that. Joseph comes into play as the firstborn of who? As the firstborn of who? Please be with me. If I leave you in this one, you will be lost. I just want you to flow with me, to follow with me. Joseph had 12, I mean, Jacob had 12 sons and one girl. He had 12 sons and one daughter. The daughter was named who? Dina, grade fives, you should know that because I told it to you yesterday. The daughter was named Dina. Joseph becomes the first wife of, uh, I'm sorry, the first son of the favorite wife of, of who? Of Jacob. Who was the favorite wife of Jacob? Come on, people, speak with me. Say, talk to me. Who was the favorite wife of uh, Jacob? Rachel, of course. Why do we say she was the favorite wife? We say she is the favorite wife because he worked for her for 14 years. 
to ensure that he, he, he gets her. After working for seven years, his father-in-law cheated him, tricked him, and gave him Leah instead of Rachel. And uh, when he realized that he was given Leah in the next morning, he was so angry at the father-in-law. He went back to him and told him, you know what? You've given me the person I didn't want. And then the father-in-law pleaded in him and told him, no, according to our culture, we cannot allow you to marry the younger daughter when the elder daughter is still within the homestead. And so, if you still want her, I can give her to you, but you have to work for another seven years so that you can get her. Of course, Joseph, uh, I mean Jacob, because he loved Rachel, he worked another seven years for who? For Rachel. And finally, or eventually, got to marry Rachel. But the story does not end there. Rachel was not able to give Jacob enough children. The favorite wife, who was the most beloved, that is Rachel, only gave birth to two children. The first child being who? Being Joseph. And so the father really loved Joseph. The father really loved Joseph. Really loved him. And at one point, he decided to make him a coat. Now, this coat was not just a literal coat. Not just like any other coat. But it was a coat with very many colors. Now, if you read through it, if you read through the study of the coat of the coat that was given to Joseph, it was not just a literal coat. And by the way, those colors were not just colors, but they were symbolic colors. It was like he was giving Joseph the power to be the priesthood in his family, of which that power was supposed to be given to the firstborn. And who was the firstborn again? Who was the firstborn again? Reuben. Reuben was the first one. You will see the favoritism that the father had over Joseph as compared to other, to other children. Number one, he was the beloved of the father. And so the father decides to make for him a beautiful coat of many colors, which made his other brothers very envious of him. They started hating him. And therefore, Joseph, the beloved of the father, turned into Joseph, the hated of the brothers. Are we together up to that point? Joseph becomes the hated of the brothers. And Joseph grows up, grows up because of the hatred that his brothers have. He even adds uh, fuel to the fire or he adds salt to the injury by telling his brothers and the father one day that, you know what, good people, I dreamt that we were in the field. And while we were in that field, we were collecting sheaves of wheat. And then all your sheaves came and bowed down to mine. Ah. The brothers interpreted that and said, okay, so you, are you trying to say that you, the young one, we are going to bow down to you? What are you trying to say? I'm very sure the likes of Simeon and Levi were not very happy with that because Simeon and Levi were the most violent in their family. I am very sure they were not happy at that. The same with Reuben, who was the first one. He must have not been happy by that. How can this young here, this young boy here, say that he's going to he's going to rule over us, that we are going to become his servants, that we are going to bow down to him? But he meant it because it was a divine revelation. God had revealed it to him. Later on, they decided to plot to kill Joseph, and so while. Uh, Joseph is sent by his father to take for them food. I mean, why do you kill somebody who has brought you food? Is it a nice thing to kill somebody who brings you food? But these brothers did not see that Joseph was serving them. Instead, they saw that Joseph was overpowering them. And so they decided, this young man, we are going to kill him. So Reuben thought as the firstborn, um, this young man, if he is killed by my brothers here, our father will definitely die. As the first one, you know, first ones are quick thinkers. He thought very quickly, quickly, and then he came up with a plot and said, good people, instead of killing him, let's dip him in, dip him in the well. You know, how can we kill one brother? And then all the people bought the idea. But in his mind, Reuben was saying, once they leave him here, I will take him out and take him back to the farm. That is what Reuben was thinking. But it was too late. When... Uh, some slave merchants or some slave traders were passing by. The Ishmaelites were passing by and they were on their way to Egypt. Another brother suggested, which brother suggested that we should sell him? Which brother suggested? 
Huh? Which brother suggested? Now I'm sending you back to go and read in your Bible so that you can tell me in the course of the week. Which brother suggested that we should sell him instead? One of the brothers gave a suggestion. But what, what, what good is it? What good is it in killing our brother? In seeing our brother dead? Why don't we sell him and get some profit out of it? And so they decided to sell him. And Joseph, the beloved brother, Joseph, the beloved son, now becomes a slave. A slave. Joseph, who was adorned with a robe like that of a king, was given a coat of many colors like that of a king, like that of a priest, is now walking naked as a slave. And Joseph goes to Egypt to fast forward everything. Joseph the slave becomes the prisoner. And Joseph the prisoner, finally, things change from being a prisoner to becoming the governor of the most powerful kingdom at that time. What was the most powerful kingdom at that time, people? What was the most powerful kingdom at that time? Come on, someone speak to you with me. What was the most powerful kingdom at that time? Egypt. Egypt. At that time, the most powerful kingdom was Egypt. And so Joseph, the prisoner, the slave, the hated of his brothers, the persecuted of his brothers, now becomes the governor, second in rank to the king himself. In other words, right now we can call him, we can call him uh, the cabinet. Tijabuki is the cabinet secretary. Or uh, the, uh, the uh, eh? head of public service. Eh? Yeah, he became a very powerful person. And later on, all those dreams as God had planned them came to pass. His brothers together with his father came and bowed to him. But at a cost, of course, that Joseph was not able to see his mother later while he was in Egypt. Why? Because the mother died at that particular time. Now, this slave who turned into a governor, that is, I've already reached chapter 39, chapter 39 of Genesis. This slave who turned into governor, chapter 41, verse 37, actually, uh -huh, he became a slave, but now he's a governor, and now this governor is reuniting this family which once hated him. When the family comes back to Egypt to seek for food, is now their savior. He's now giving them, he's now giving them food. And then he calls them to come and live with him in Egypt. And in the land of Goshen, where they were located to live, he became the favorite of the king. And through Joseph, through Joseph, everyone at that particular time, when that king was still alive, was loved and was favored by the king of Egypt. Until something happened, of course, after Joseph died and the king died and another king came on board, he started persecuting the children of Israel. But today we want to talk about Joseph. When Joseph gets old in the book of Genesis chapter, in the book of Genesis chapter, uh, let me take us to the book of Genesis chapter 50. When Joseph gets old, when Joseph gets old, and is about to die. He has seen his great grandchildren. He is old right now and tired in the land of Egypt. Joseph, the favored of the king, Joseph, who was blessed twice by his father. By the way, when the father, who was Jacob, was dying, was about to die, he called all his sons, all of them, from the order of the firstborn. He started with Reuben and he came to them in order of their birth as he was prophesying to them about their lives. He told them, you Reuben, you're supposed to be the firstborn, but you are as weak as the waters. You're being tossed. You don't have a decision. And therefore you shall be scattered amongst your brethren. You've lost that authority. He spoke to them, all of them, and you realize in his blessings, he decides to bless Joseph two times. How does he bless Joseph two times? Joseph had two sons. He decides to bless both of the sons of Joseph. And as you keep on studying the scripture, you realize that, uh, you realize that the tribe of Joseph, which was now represented by his two sons, the tribe of Joseph, which is now represented by his two sons, 
take over two tribes in Israel and they stand out as stronger than all those other two tribes which were cursed by the father. Joseph, the favored, Joseph is dying. But when Joseph is dying, I want us to derive a message, you to draw a message that, uh, that speaks to us today on this Holy Sabbath day. When Joseph is dying, the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews chapter 11 verse 22, which we read, Hebrews chapter 11 verse 22, that when Joseph was on his deathbed, can somebody open for us the book of Genesis chapter 50? Let's go to the book of Genesis chapter 50. Chapter 50. Let's go to the book of Genesis chapter 50. Genesis chapter 50. Genesis chapter 50. Uh -huh. Have you reached Genesis chapter 50? Yeah. All right. Good, 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 good. The last chapter of the book of Genesis records the death of Joseph, and it ends with a very beautiful message that we ought to understand. Genesis chapter 50, as from verse 22. Verse 22. The scripture says, we will read it together. Give me an eye on the screen. That's what we will use to read together today. Genesis chapter 50, verse 22. The scripture says, yes, let's read it. Uh -huh. How many years did Joseph live? How many years? 110 years. Joseph lived for 110 years. Uh -huh. Verse 23. Let's go. Uh -huh. Remember, Ephraim was one of the sons of Joseph. So you saw up to the third generation, when he was 110 years old, he's now dying. And he decides to call all the children of Israel. Unlike his father, who decided to call the children, uh, the sons, he decides to call everyone in Israel. Let's go. Then Joseph said to his brothers, verse 24, Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die. But God will surely come to your aid and take you up out of this land to the land he promised on earth to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Joseph knew very well that he's dying. That is one thing we really need to, 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 to take a note of. Joseph knew that he was dying. His time on planet Earth was coming to an end. His time to be with his brothers, to be with his brethren, was coming to an end. And therefore he calls all of them, he brings them together and tells them, I know my time is coming to an end, but that is not what I've called you here to tell you. I've called you here to tell you one main thing. I've called you here to tell you that God will surely come to your aid. God will surely come to your aid and he will surely ensure that you go to that promised land which he made to our ancestors Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Look at that. I want you to think about such a faith. He calls them. He does not tell them that you know what, my son or my brothers, I have this property. I have been a governor in Egypt for this long. I have this property. I want you... Eliezer to take this one. I want you this to take this one. I want you Reuben to take this. No, 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 he does not do that. I want you this to take this. No, he does not do that. Instead, what he tells them is, I am dying. But the message that I want to bring on board to you, my brothers, is that in as much as I am dying, there is some promise, there is some hope that God gave to our ancestors and I want you to hold it firm. To hold it firm. And to make the point sink deeper, he goes ahead and tells them this. Let's go verse 25. And Joseph, uh, verse 26. Uh -huh. So Joseph, uh, no, no, give me back verse 25. Give me verse 25. Let's go together. And Joseph made the sons of... Uh -huh. God will surely come to your aid. Uh -huh. And then you must carry my bones up from this place. Now, I want you to... Look at this, it in this scenario. What Joseph is trying to tell his brothers, together with his sons and the grandsons and the great great grandsons, and everyone who is related to him, is this one thing that I'm going to die in this land where I've gathered all my riches. 
I'm going to die in this land where I am favored by the king. I'm going to die in this land where I am the most powerful, second in rank to the king. I'm going to die in this land where all of you came worshiping me. I'm going to die in this land which has a lot of plenty, which has everything that is expected to feed you for generations and generations to come. But, please, do not bury me in this land. That is what he's saying. Do not. Do not bury me in this land. Why? Because I believe in a promise that God gave our ancestors, Isaac, Jacob, Abraham, that he will take us to a promised land. He did not know that land. Joseph did not know that land. In fact, he was taken away from his homestead when he was still a young boy at 17 years old. So he does not know this land. But he still kept that faith in his head, in his mind, to continuously remind him that one day we will go back to that land. But he died without going back to that land. And so he's telling those who are present there that I know very well, and I'm dying with this hope and faith that God is going to take us to a certain land, a promised land, the land that he promised to our ancestors. And when you go there, that is where I want to be buried. That is where I want to be what? Now, I want to ask you a question. Somebody asked me a question yesterday while I was teaching religious uh, in grade 5. I don't know whether it was Charlene or it was Lois, but one of the girls. She asked me that, teacher, I heard that the first president of Kenya was not buried, that he was put somewhere where people go and see him. Good. Now you all know from that question. He was not buried. Eh? He was not buried. He's put somewhere where if you want to go and see the late first president of Kenya, you will just be allowed to go there and see him. When... You got that? His body is still there. So if you want to go and see the first president of Kenya, you will just go there, you will find him. But he's dead, eh? But the body is dried somewhere. So you can just go and see him. Now, back to us. That was almost what Joseph was requesting the children of Israel to do. He told them, I don't want to be buried, but I want you to put my body in a coffin. To put my body in a, in a, what is a coffin? Geneva, that thing where you put, yes. Put my body in a coffin and ensure that when you leave this place, you carry me along and take me to that promised land. Aish, what a faith, what a faith. Let's finish that verse, let's finish that verse, verse, uh -huh. let's finish the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis, verse, the next one, the last one, uh -huh. and so let's read. Mm -hmm. He was placed in a coffin in Egypt. Joseph, what is the significance of Joseph's remains remaining in Egypt? Though Joseph Though Egypt was the home of Joseph, we can actually say Egypt was the home of Joseph because he was taken away from his home at the age of 17. And he stayed in Egypt up to the age of 110 years old. So we can confidently say that he lived most of his life in Egypt. But though Egypt was largely his home, where he had risen to greatness, Joseph did not forget God's promise to give descendants of Abraham a promised land. He had the following pleasures in Egypt. He had the pleasures of power. He was the governor in Egypt. He had the pleasure of being in favor with the king. He had the pleasure of having a home full of food. He had the pleasure of a luxurious burial. In fact, if there were people who buried the, the, the dead in this history far better than anyone else, it was the Egyptians. The Egyptians used to bury people far much better than anyone in history. There has never been a better burial rite huh, in this entire world that is recorded than that of Egypt. Especially to the powerful people like kings in Egypt. 
You've heard about the, the, the pyramids in Egypt, right? They were the burial sites of the kings and the who's and who's of Egypt. And I'm very, very sure if Joseph gave a command, because he had a sway over the king, he was a friend of the king, the king loved him, the king gave him a lot of favor. I am very sure if Joseph requested or wrote a note to the king telling him that if I die, please bury me like the kings, he could have been buried like the kings. Because he was very much favored. But he didn't want that. Instead of choosing that kind of special and beautiful and magnificent burial, Joseph said, I just want you to carry my bones back to our land. Why did Joseph not tell his brothers, when I die, take my body and go and bury me in the land of Machpelah? Do you know the land of Machpelah? Yes, the land of Machpelah was the burial site or the burial grave site for the patriarchs. When Jacob was dying while he was in Egypt, the same, same thing, the same, same place, while he was dying, he called all his sons, including Joseph, and told them, if I die here, don't bury me here. Take me to the land of my fathers and bury me at Machpelah, where my wives are buried. And that is what, what happened. When he died, immediately, the king sent chariots of, with mourners together with the brothers, and they went and buried their father, Jacob. But how come now Joseph is not requesting that he should be buried together with his father? Joseph is saying a very, very interesting thing, that if I die here, don't even bother to bury me yet. Okay? Because Joseph wanted his bones remaining in Egypt, he wanted them to stay there as a constant reminder to the children of Israel that one day we are going to bury these bones and we are not going to bury them here or on the way, but we are going to bury them in the promised land. Can somebody say amen? Ah, if you are a believer, you could have shouted a, a bigger amen to that. Eh? Can somebody say amen? Amen, 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 amen. Uh, so despite all these beautiful pleasures and all these wonderful burial rites of the Egyptians, Joseph chose to remain in a casket in Egypt. What is the significance of this casket? What is the significance of this casket? Joseph, in the book of, in the book of, uh, in the book of Genesis chapter 50 verse 26, which we have already read, says that Joseph died and he was put in a coffin in Egypt and there he stayed until when the children of Israel were rescued as he had said, as he had prophesied, as his faith had held on. If you go to the book of Exodus chapter 13 verse 19, after the 10th plague, when now Moses is telling the children of Israel, let us go, Exodus chapter 13 verse 19, open that for us so that we read it together. The book of Exodus chapter 13 verse 19, after the 10th plague and the Pharaoh says, now you people of Israel, go get out of here. It is too much for me. After that, after that, after that, Moses does something. Let's read it together. <laughs> Let's read it together again. Uh -huh. Moses took the bones of with him because Joseph had made the sons of Israel swear an oath. What was the oath? He had said, let's read it. God will surely come to your aid and then you must carry my bones up with you from this place. So, as Joseph died, brothers and sisters, he not only inspired more faith in his death to those who were remaining, but he also ensured that the coffin was a daily reminder to the children of Israel. I don't know whether Joseph knew that after his death there was going to become persecution in Egypt. I don't know. But what I know, that every single day the children of Israel were being persecuted and beaten harshly and crying every single day, they would get back. And when they come back to the land of Goshen, and then they meet the coffin of Joseph, and they look at it and see bones of Joseph, I'm very sure they would remember that God will come and rescue you from this place. I'm very sure about that. Because it was a promise that one day, take these bonds, go bury them in the promised land. It was a constant reminder. 
it was one of the things that constantly, constantly put, uh, that, that constantly remained as a monument of faith in Israel. It was a daily reminder of God's promise through oppression. It was a sure testimony of faith and trust as they traveled to Canaan. And I'm very sure as they were on their way to the promised land, as they were being meeting those, meeting those other tribes and fighting them, fighting battles, the tribes almost destroying them, almost killing them. I'm very sure as much as plagues came to their lives, almost sweeping everyone, before they reached the promised land, they could still look back at those bones and say, oh, we have not yet reached the promised land, but we will surely reach the promised land. And surely there will be some people to reach the promised land because this coffin has to be carried to the promised land. I'm very sure about that. They will look at it when a plague comes, almost destroying everyone. They look at it and remember, God, you promised us that these bones must reach promised land, meaning that there are some people who must reach the promised land to carry this coffin with them to that promised land. And therefore, they could, it could help to revive their faith in God. That is the kind of faith, brothers and sisters, that I want to live with you. In this institution, we have set a series of monuments a series of reminders, a series of coffins on our path to act as a reminder or to serve as a reminder that this land is not our home and that this institution is just but preparing us to that home, to that promised land in heaven. Can someone say amen? Amen. We have set, I have set before you a series of monuments that should remind you of the Father's love. I have set before you a series of, a series of activities that should remind you of God's desire for us to yearn for that promised land. And may all these monuments inspire faith in you. Can you say amen? I am now uttering a blessing upon you and you are not saying amen. May these monuments inspire faith in you. May they give you hope in difficult times. May they give you the drive and the willpower to do that which God wants you to do. May they give you the courage to take one day at a time in your lives. Paul says in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 1, which is our last scripture reading, Paul says in his final journey, in his final journey, Paul says to the Corinthians, he says the following words in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 1. The Bible says, let's read it together. I want you to read it with me again. Let's go. Follow example as I follow. An example of Christ. Maybe, maybe throughout my stay in, in pace, I may have not set a perfect example for you to follow. But today I want to call upon you. That example that I set that imitates Christ, I would like to call you to follow it. Can you say amen? If I have set an example worthy of imitating, an example worthy of following the footsteps of Jesus, I would like you to follow that example. But the greatest message of all is that at the end of all things, after everything has been said and done, after everything has been put up, after the monuments have been erected, after summons have been delivered, after projects have been launched, after activities have been initiated, what remains is that they should all help to point you to heaven. Can you say amen? Maybe, or perhaps, perhaps, I did not do my best. Perhaps, I did not make you see Christ in me. Perhaps, we may have created beautiful memories, but these memories don't lead us to Christ. Probably these memories are helping, pushing us and pushing us and pushing us away from God. I pray today that you pick that which will help you to develop in your Christian walk.